Hey guys, this will be video 13 for the how to design build a 50s era uh, Explorer replica. And uh, I got the fretboard glued on a um, few several days ago and uh, did not do any shaping or anything. Well, I did a little bit of shaping, so we'll cover that stuff later on in the video. But what I want to do is get the table emptied off a little bit so I've got room to actually move and do a bit of a flyby and stuff like that. But what I want to cover in this video is primarily going to be related to uh, several different things, but mostly related to uh, transitioning from uh, making certain that you get that fretboard uh, and the neck on the center line, or as I mentioned in the last video, uh, your version of the center line, <laughs> in case you missed it. What I meant by creating your own center line is if is if you missed it just ever so slightly, it's no big deal for this uh, bridge to, you know, move in a certain direction, j just a little, not not much. And when I say a little, uh, a thirty second of an inch, may maybe a little bit more than that. You're not going to see it, but nonetheless, the whole objective is when you're building a guitar is to work off the center line, uh, uh, wherever that's, whatever that center line might be, whether it's the actual glue line of the body or the actual center line of the footprint. So, and I'm, I'm gonna just, just, I'm gonna stop talking about that because uh, if, you're, if you're reading between the lines and you're, you're hearing what I'm saying, you know exactly what I'm saying. Uh, but in other words, don't freak out if you, if you miss your target a little bit and you have to make some adjustments. But after you have verified that you got that fretboard exactly where you want it, I'm gonna go ahead and cover this a little bit. If I, because if I don't, I probably will forget it. Once you get that fretboard exactly where you want it, uh, then you're gonna want to pin, uh, uh, drill a real small hole through this location here or somewhere in that location. Uh, why? Because if you screwed up and went too deep, you're not gonna come out of the back of the neck. But then up here. I go ahead and I drill a small hole right here as well. And then I, I do a pin location right here. In other words, alignment pins. And then an alignment pin right there. Because sometimes I epoxy my fretboards down and that takes a good uh, hour or hour and a half for it to actually start uh, setting where that uh, fretboard is not moving. But this fretboard is different. This fretboard was glued down with tight bond so that in the event this thing experienced uh, horrific damage, it would be easy to get this fretboard off of the, the lower and salvage the fretboard and replace the lower neck if it were broken or something like that. Okay, so in other words, this was tight bond, tight, tight bond glued down. So let me back up and just get right back on my point list because I think that's gonna be the quickest way to finish this video in under 45 minutes to an hour. So what I'm gonna be covering is, uh, let me just do this, let me check, let me get my marker and check this off. And that way when I want to digress and just go off the rails and talk about stuff, I can. And then I can just look down and note that, uh, you know, I've already covered it. Uh, so the second thing would, would be after you get the fretboard uh, al aligned, and your pin location is located, then you pull your fretboard off. So you haven't glued it down yet. Then you can take your template and you can put it up there and route out your neck location. Because I will have to digress here briefly because what will happen now is you're wanting to verify that you get this uh, pickup ring exactly where you want it, but, there, but that there's still just a little bit of real estate right here in other words it's not a hollow because these pickup rings they do fairly get fairly close if not almost kiss the end of the fretboard okay so that's your target so in other words you want to you want to route that out and then the next thing I, I, I don't I don't really have time to talk about it but if, if you know how to if you got this far you know how to use a router and if you know how to use a router then you know how to use templates and by getting that fretboard in its location, uh, I knew exactly where the fretboard 
exactly where the fretboard, I gotta get that marker out of here so I don't risk getting, and look at me grab a pen. Uh, always keep pens and markers away from your guitars, especially when you're, let me get that off the table. Especially when you got raw wood like that, because if that marker kissed up against that and bled into that, oh man, what a nightmare that would be. But what you're trying to do, you're trying to determine exactly where this fretboard is going to end so that you know exactly where the pickup ring is going to go down and then you can determine your final route work okay that ought to be pretty much uh self-explanatory i think i can uh, discipline myself to keep this marker away from it so then after you've routed that neck pickup then you're able to uh, determine how you want to glue that fretboard down, whether it be within, a, within, a, within a, an epoxy or with a tight bond. I would strongly recommend uh, always going with a tight bond unless you just really know what you're doing because the tight bond, uh, the glue lines, are they virtually just disappear, and it's really beautiful. So we'll cover that stuff in a little while when we're doing the flyby. So in other words, you got your fretboard aligned, Pulled it off, you routed out that neck pickup, and then you're ready to either epoxy and or tight bond, glue your fretboard down. And when you're gluing the fretboard down, since you've got the alignment pins in there, uh, usually what I do, I'm not gonna talk about the amount of glue you use because if you're not good with doing uh, glue work, then I, would, I wouldn't recommend you, do, you doing the glue work. I would recommend you know, maybe taking it to a cabinet shop, but basically all I'm doing is putting just enough glue. On, I put glue on the lower surface and then it's all nice and clean. And then I put glue on the back of the fretboard surface and I make sure that there's just enough to do the job. And then I come in and because of the pins, I'm able to simply do a uh, four clamps. I do, you know, just equal distances, uh, four nice clamps, not too much crushing pressure, but you do want to uh, sit here with a wet cloth, put a little pressure on it, clean off the squeeze out. Put a little bit more pressure, wait a few minutes, there'll be a little bit of squeeze out. Clean out the squeeze out. Keep, uh, keep continuing to apply your pressure e equally distributed until you get to the point to where you don't see any more squeeze out. Then just verify that, and, and you're always verifying that your fretboard is not slipping or anything like that and then um, and then it'll be uh, it'll be dry enough it'll be dry enough within uh, probably 30 minutes that uh, just leave the clamping pressure on there but if you did if you did discover a problem it, it would still be uh, plenty of time for you to be able to take all the clamps loose and get a real thin blade putty knife under it and just kind of ease under it, maybe mist a little bit of water and then just kind of uh, slowly uh, ease the fretboard off, clean it up nice and clean. I mean, nice and wet and then uh, put it over to the side, flip the lights off and approach it another day or, or the next day. Don't try to jump right back in the ring unless you have a heat gun and you know how to do all that stuff. Okay. So, uh, and where I'm going with this, you want to leave the back of the neck rough so you can do your fret work without damaging the uh, fretboard. I mean, the, uh, the back of the neck. Okay, so I, I wasn't very organized there talking about that, but nonetheless, I think you guys get the, get the drift. Uh, I just didn't want to fool with uh, trying to do all this work on camera because it would have done, it would have been three or four videos and it would have been exhausting and it would have been frustrating. And uh, when I'm doing fretboard work, I don't want to be distracted because I want to make certain that I don't screw anything up. I did shape the hill uh, to about 90% of where I want it. Very happy with that, it's really beautiful. Uh, still has just a little bit more work to do. And keep in mind, since this is a guitar built for a client, it'll be the client's final call as to uh, do, do I go ahead and take off about another, uh, you know, sixteenth of an inch to make it look a little bit more like you know who, or do we like the profile that I've done, which personally I think is far more beautiful than theirs. 
it is more, this looks more like an actual 50s Les Paul than a, uh, an Explorer and or a, a Flying V. Because the Explorer and the Flying V had a very square, I mean, it's just very straight across here and very flat. But this thing has a beautiful, it feels like a Les Paul because I've built so many of the Gretsch and, and Les Paul type uh, guitars and jazz guitars. They're all, you know, they're all pretty much the same. But uh, it's, it's really, the hill is really beautiful in that respect. I'll try to get a little bit of a flyby there. But uh, again, this is probably the most, one of the most beautiful solid body guitars I've ever put together. And you gotta have your Prince purple strap locks to do your test, but to, to do your uh, strap lock test because, and I'm glad I went off the cuff there, the whole objective after you get the fretboard glued down, come back the next day or, you know, two days later, uh, they claim that, you know, you could start working uh, with a, a water-based glue within a, a couple few hours. I would, I would let it dry a good 24 hours because there have been plenty of times where I've taken things out of like heavy clamps only to discover like two or three hours later, only to only to discover that I found some uh, tight bond glue that had gotten squeezed over into a location and robbed of any oxygen or any air, and it was still sticky. We're talking three or four hours later. So give it a good 24 hours. That'll guarantee that your a tight bond truly. Uh, uh, penetrates into both surfaces and dries really well and then after that uh, then you're ready uh, you know a day or two later to uh, start doing some of your initial shaping and uh, so let's on that note let me check the time I may pause and uh, we're going to talk about strap buttons uh, stuff here and the balance test so yeah let me pause and re get re get reorganized here because I want to talk about the critical importance of doing a uh, center of, of gravity and balance test and assessment before you start installing your strap buttons. So let me get the table cleaned up a little bit and I'll be right back. Okay, uh, I had to resist the temptation of uh, just looking at the pictures and asking myself where should this strap button location be in relation to this uh, large line right here because that's a that's a really uh, that's a lot of distance right there and I didn't want to miss this by a uh, half of an inch on either side but I also wanted to make certain that once the guitar was strapped across your shoulder that it truly felt uh, uh, really good because that was one of the uh, tricks about when I was, uh, I don't think I've got one of, the, one of them in here, but when I started redesigning the Flying V and building it per my own specs, it was so amazing how critical getting this strap button down here in, it, in the appropriate location was and how it affected the whole guitar because this is very similar to the Flying V in that this strap button is not up here at the 16th fret location like the Les Paul, or it's not up here at the 14th fret location like a Strat, you know, which is, that that's a considerable jump in distance, even from just the Les Paul, which would be at the 16th fret location, down to, uh, now we're looking at, at, at roughly the, well, that's the 19th, the 20th, now we're, we're at the 21st fret location. That's, that's virtually identical to the way the Flying V is. Now this offsets that weight and balance thing because of this mass here. There's a lot of weight here that helps, helps the, the, the weight and balance of the guitar stay closer to the center there, not get too body heavy. But what, what you wanna do, the long way around this, is look at your pictures and, and ask yourself, okay, we know this location here is not right up here and it's not down here. However, it's really cool. I saw an old picture of, uh, oh God, I never can think of the guy's name, uh, uh, Clap, uh, Clapton, Eric Clapton. He was playing one of his old Flying Vs, the one that was, I mean, I explores the one that was uh, boxed really bad down here. Someone had cut it apart, but he had moved his strap button to this location right here because you could see the way his strap was in the picture. It was, it was going down here somewhere. Okay, so and so what does that mean? 
that means that there was a possibility that that guitar that he was playing had a bit of a headstock headstock dive issue and someone in the past might have attempted to move it up and alleviate that or either they just you know a lot of people are doing that because of the whole sg era as well but once you find this location right here and you know that it's not up here and it's not down here and i'm talking about if, as long as it's uh, mounted in this location right here it's basically about just over 55 to 60 percent from here to here it's about 60 percent once you find that one point then you can triangulate uh, by looking at your pictures where they have their strap button located and you can triangulate from uh, what you see in the picture across the center of that strap button and then bring it down here and ask yourself where does that where does that line intersect down here at the headstock man the last thing i'll do is knock that off the table uh let's see if that's on the camera and where it did intersect was right here so if you drew a line from from just below the corner of the headstock through the center of the strap button that's where you want that's where you want to drill for your strap button location down there okay now i can get that off the tape that's exactly what you did. didn't measure anything uh, because of the attempt the drawings that i have for building this guitar did not have that identified and i wanted to make certain that i at least looked at all the online pictures because you couldn't use this Les Paul template which shows okay if you're building a Les Paul well then you put the strap button right here there's a little score line right there and then we know with the Les Paul it's right on the center of the body but and this is this is where I'm going with this because I had never built this guitar before I didn't know what it was going to feel like once you put the strap on, on it based on the original locations and if I if it had been a headstock diving, you know what, I probably would have started manipulating the location of this strap button just a little bit to try to help that out. So what I wanted to do was put this, and I'm not going to do it, but I, 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 let me see, uh, 19, somewhere in that area right there. Well, very close to where the pickups are. Uh, so we know that the strap button on the Les Paul, okay. Would be coming along this area right here hanging on our body in a certain fashion and i know this is not a last ball that we're building but i'm just trying to differentiate differentiate between what 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 would i need to do to make my custom guitar feel at least like either a Les Paul or a Strat or a Tele so that it doesn't feel odd once it's hanging across my shoulder and once I started evaluating the, the, the vast differences between the Explorer and the Les Paul, I was a little bit spooked at first thinking, oh man, I hope this thing doesn't feel really weird. So going straight to the finish line, it didn't feel weird at all. And, and it feels absolutely amazing hanging on, uh, across your shoulder just in its original location. And now that I'm through with that, now that I'm through with that, I can get that off the table, but where I'm going with this, I think, uh, I think they spent an enormous amount of time uh, with uh, weight and balance. And when I talk about weight and balance, I'm talking about down this axis here, the, uh, that would be the roll axis, and this relates to flying an airplane. You got pitch, pitch down, pitch up, you got roll, and then you have yaw, okay? And when you're installing your fretboard, you're dealing with the yaw axis of the fretboard and the neck going into the body. You get the yaw axis under control first, then, and you're making certain that the roll of the fretboard is not high right here. At a minimum, if, 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 the, if the fretboard was not perfectly on the same... Uh, a roll axis as the top of the body, even if it's pitched, then at a minimum you would want the uh, fretboard to roll lower at the base side so that your bridge does not end up having to be cocked like this right here. That ought to make perfect sense. If you don't understand that, 
just don't let your fretboard, you know, get get high on this side. If anything, make sure the fretboard board is perfectly level and or is a little bit rolled on the bass side. But even when I build my big body jazz guitars, we don't roll them. Even Robert Benedetto said that. It's like, don't don't roll them. Some, some builders do that, but uh, I wouldn't recommend that. So keep everything nice and flat. So you got the uh, pitch, you got the uh, uh, center line, uh, Axis under control. You got the uh, uh, pitch, the roll, and then the, the yaw. I'm sorry. You got the yaw axis under control first. You got the pitch uh, under control, and then you got your uh, yaw, yaw roll, roll, pitch, and yaw. Okay. Almost confusing myself there. So the next thing would be after that, you've determined. Okay, what what's the whole idea of the center? Where where is the center balance? Of this guitar if we're if we're going to lay this body atop a uh, a triangle like that and find the center and start ch making changes then we're going to want to start assessing where where is the center of balance of this guitar along uh, uh, that axis right there the center line axis is is it up here on the body or is it, is it up here, or is it down here, or is it right in the middle? And what's gonna blow your mind, let's see if I can put that right there so that you guys can get a visual. What's gonna, I'm gonna go straight at the finish line and tell you that basically this design is so close to the actual center line of the body, it's amazing. And that's very, that let me know that Gibson really took the time with whatever they had going on weight and balance down here they didn't let it get out of control up there and i'm going to stop talking before i give away trade secrets but that was just some of my discoveries and i realized wow there, this is so much more than just a pretty face or kind of a of a, of a real unique play on lines they really maintain a, a a very functional guitar within that footprint Okay, and not only did they get it along that axis, but they got it along this axis as well. This is, this is really hard. It's easy to do on a table where you're not having to. See where I'm going with this? And I used to build uh, uh, performance marine engines. So I've done a lot of machine work and actually, uh, if you guys have been here for a long time, you know that my, my original YouTube channel was Tiki Hut Machine Shop, and it started down in South Florida. And I used to show you how to uh, do uh, uh, how to balance your rotating mass and your reciprocates, reciprocating mass within a, a, an engine. And uh, that stuff's incredible. Uh, it's, it's really critical. And but also, if you're like building an airplane, you know you've got center of gravities, and then you're either forward of gravity, you're behind gravity, and all that kind of jazz. And I don't want to start talking about that. But the fact that they they built this huge platform and kept it that well balanced. Now that's at the front. That's basically balanced at that location right there. And guess guess what's identical to that? The flying V. The flying V. Its center of gravity along the perpendicular axis is exactly in that same location. So they took a lot of time in house to get these guitars uh, balanced. And the reason I've got that uh, Les Paul up on the table, let me see if I can put this down here without knocking it over. Okay. I'll try to just do this very quickly. Now, obviously, the other one doesn't have a uh, the the Explorer does not have the uh, the tuners on it, but look how close we are. Okay, now obviously this one has the frets in it, which you'd be surprised the frets, the strings, the tuners uh, up here at the headstock. So if when you start looking at the center of gravity on this little custom burst less ball that I've designed and built. And this is not even per their templates, but you see that the center, the perpendicular center of gravity on this guitar design is up here closer to the, the neck pickup. Well, guess what will happen?
guess what will happen to this guitar once you get all the tuners up here. You get all this weight up here and all of these uh, frets in and all that jazz, that perpendicular center of gravity is going to start moving forward. Because I'm gonna put a little bit of weight on because what's gonna happen is the weight up here is now gonna make this guitar feel more like an authentic uh, product. It's not, they're not gonna, you're not gonna strap this guitar on and feel oddly different from playing a Les Paul or uh, Flying V. Okay, so there's a lot more design that went into this guitar than I, than I even realized. And uh, it's probably one of the main reasons that uh, I was watching a, a video, uh, Keith Williams of Five Watt World, and he was talking about how uh, he uh, consulted with Phil Jones. And uh, I met Phil Jones up in Nashville a long time ago when I was beginning to, to build guitars. And he wouldn't remember me from a, 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 a blade of grass on the side of the highway, but he was instrumental in helping me get into guitar building because he suggested... I call a few different guys up in the Nashville area, and uh, he was just a, a very cool, gentle spirit and a very nice guy. And Phil Jones was one of the first employees in the Gibson Custom Shop, and he was uh, instrumental in helping uh, Keith Williams of Five Watt World uh, do some of the research on the historical guitars. And uh, Phil was one of the guys in the Custom Shop back in the, I think in the 80s, that was advocating uh, that, they, that they really start uh, 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 reintroducing the Explorer. And I have played one of Phil's guitars. I played a hardtail uh, um, Strat that was the, uh, the red, Fiesta, Fiesta Red. And that was at a guitar shop uh, called uh, Big uh, uh, Rock, Rock Block. If you guys remember Rock Block Guitars, uh, one of Phil Jones's uh, strats was in there, and it was a through-body hardtail strat. That's one of the best playing guitars I've ever played. So if 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 anyone knows Phil out there, uh, the guy's really knowledgeable, and he was a huge fan of the Explorer. So, all right, so let me pause, regroup, and then we're going to talk about uh, carving a neck. Okay, uh, maybe we'll finish the video in this one, uh, this one go, uh, but probably not. <laughs> uh, there's there's a ton of stuff to cover here on this list, uh, but the main reason I had mentioned going ahead and finding those strap button locations, getting the strap across your body and getting this body in your hand, is so you can feel, so you can feel start feeling the neck and the heel and the, the, the upper register, the, the upper register, the lower register on your body in relation to where this guitar wants to hang and where your, where your palm wants to plant, then you can start determining how to shape the neck. And if you didn't hear what I just said, rewind it because that's the most critical part of the whole build. Some people would be tempted at this point to just go online and go, okay, how thick is a, an Explorer supposed to be right here at the 11th fret? And how thick is it supposed to be at the first fret? And what is a 60s guitar supposed to feel like? And what's a 50s guitar supposed to feel like? Blah, 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 blah. And most people get lost in the idiocy of trying to replicate, replicate what someone else tells them is correct or is incorrect. You lose, the, you lose the ability to build a phenomenal guitar that fits your hand. Uh, I'm not a big guy, but uh, I, got, I don't have any, any fat on my hands at all. And I've got kind of long fingers for my size. And even like when I was, when I was getting into uh, pistols, I was considering, you know, the, the Glock. And, I, and I'd heard all these people go, oh, the Glock, the, 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 the handle is so big, it's so fat, it's so this. They, they had me so wound up, and I was so fearful to consider the 40 caliber Glock. And even the, the 9 mil, I didn't want the 9, I wanted the 40, but I knew that it was going to be the Glock 22, which is kind of the fat stock. And then I was thinking about even a 10 millimeter. Well, sure enough, I, I got a hold of a, of a 40, a Glock 40, which is the, the Glock 22, got got my my paws on it and I realized 
what what is what is going on with all these idiots online? And I realized that my grip around that 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 stock was so or so so comfortable. It was perfect. And and so I'll say that to say this: if you're a big guy and you got really muscular hands and maybe even have a little bit of fat on your hands, then yeah, you probably need to go with a thinner neck. But if you're a small guy with uh, real thin hands and whatnot, you'll be able to go with a, a really thick, thick neck, real chunky neck. And that neck will feel great in your hands. It's different for this story. Why? Because this is a client's guitar. This is not my guitar. And this guy, uh, is pro he's, he's already bought one guitar from me. And he mentions like, yeah, you know, everything was great, but that neck was just a little bit bigger than I wanted. And that guy is considerably bigger than I am. And I realized right then that, well, okay, then we'll, we'll go with more of a 60s profile on this neck. But until you get that strap button on, that strap button on, put this baby across your person. And this is not, this is not uh, ego, or not, you're not standing in a mirror, you know, seeing what you look like with it, but you just want to feel w what's in your hands. Then you can start determining how to shape the neck. Okay. And I, and I, I wanted to just come right out of the gate and start talking about that stuff, but I wanted to drive home the importance of if you're building a custom guitar based on this footprint right here, but you're going to come in here and do that stuff like whomever owned the guitar that Eric Clapton had. And if you're going to come in here and do something custom or really unique and, and this, uh, this tail pin location is going to end up being, somewhere in this area over here well then it's going to change it's going to change everything about how the guitar hangs on you okay so 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 what do you do next after you get that let me just read my note uh it's very important uh, before final neck and neck and heel profile work because of what you feel in your hands and uh so going straight to the finish line my target is I want to start out at 15 sixteenths max at the first fret. That's the thickness. And then one and one sixteenth inch max at the 11th fret. I'm talking about thicknesses. So I might throw some of the metric out there later, but 15, well, I think I wrote it down. Yeah, uh, 15 sixteenths 15 16 at the first fret or 24 millimeter if you want a fat neck. That's a very thick neck. That's a, that's a very thick neck, regardless of whether you do a 7 8 inch radius or whether you do a, a 1 inch radius. And we won't talk about that stuff because I already covered it in past videos. This is a 1 inch radius initial machine work. And right now, I'm at, I am just under, uh, I'm actually just over 7 eighths of an inch. This guitar is going to finish out just under 7 eighths of an inch. But you wouldn't want to, you know, you know, try to machine that on the front end all the way up to your final target of seven eighths of an inch because you probably would miss it. Or if you made a mistake and you had a little bit of a nick, well, then you wouldn't have any room to uh, correct your mistake. Eleventh fret location is right here. Uh, my guitar measures out one and one sixteenths of an inch thick. That's way too much guitar, but I'd rather have way too much guitar than just barely not enough. Okay. So, and that's 27 millimeter. Your target should be seven eighths of an inch if you want like your traditional, just, you know, Les Paul type feeling neck, uh, seven eighths of an inch or 22 millimeter at the first fret. At your 11th fret location, you want that to be uh, uh, right at about one and one thirty second of an inch max or around 25 millimeter. Now the reason I say that is so, because I wrote here on my notes, uh, that might not be the guitar you want, and I get that, that's okay. But you might find that if you play this guitar like that, with that neck for a while, don't even do any clear cut work, just string up the guitar and play it acoustically for a week or so, you might find that you enjoy that, whatever profile you have, because you might be playing the guitar a little bit higher on your body, a little bit lower, or a little bit more on an angle, like a Randy Rhodes would hold the guitar where the neck is, man, pointing up on an 80 degree angle where he's got it almost, almost playing it like a cello, like a cello, ch uh, cello player would play. 
but Stumac, Stumac with the uh, the 54 to 59 Les Paul profile, they claim that the first fret thickness, and again, I'm talking about thickness from the front of the fretboard to the back of the neck, finished would be 0.885 or, or uh, 885 thousandths, which is, um, that's actually over seven eighths of an inch, but it's under, uh, well under 15 sixteenths. It's just, just barely over seven eighths thick. And that would have equate to, like I said earlier, a little bit over 22 millimeter, around 22 millimeter. The 11th fret location, Stuart McDonald claims that their, their 50s Les Paul that they measured was a 0 0.990, uh, 990 thousandths. So just, just under an inch. So they claim that a, a 50s Les Paul would, would basically be 7 eighths of an inch thick at the first fret and just ever so slightly under 1 eighth the under one inch at the 11th fret. So what does that tell you? That's a one eighth inch pitch transition in thickness. Okay. And the widths are just what they are. The widths will vary, but typically you're, you're one and 11 sixteenths of an inch at the nut, or maybe one in 23, 30 seconds. And you're uh, give or take uh, just a, a very, very small amount you're around two and three sixteenths of an inch right here at the at the eighteenth to the nineteenth fret location. Uh, I got a guitar upstairs I built. It's actually over, it's over two and a quarter at that location, and I love it. I love it. I got all the platform in the world that I need, but it's it's a fairly thin profile neck. So if you go really thin, then you, you're you're in uncharted territory for me because I don't like a real thin neck guitar. So, you know, just build your own guitar, as I say. <laughs> but nonetheless, those numbers are basically what I've experienced from uh, restoring a, uh, a early 80s Les Paul and then building a 55 uh, Les Paul custom replica for a guy that, man, he wanted a baseball bat. And even, even I was uncomfortable with that neck. It was so big, but once he received the guitar, he, he, he loved it. So it was amazing. Uh, but those numbers I gave you are very close to your traditional guitar. But play it for a week or so and then make the decision as to whether or not you want to uh, thin it up a little bit. Uh, if it were too thin and you wanted to add material, well, you might build it up with some clear coat, but doubtful. But it'll be very easy uh, a week or two from now to just come in here with very simple uh, straight uh, blocks. And I love using this uh, Stuart McDonald uh, fret um, leveling uh, block. And that's a 12 inch radius here, but it's obviously perfectly flat on this side. So a lot of times you'll see me picking this up and then I'll be coming across here and then I'll be doing a little bit of rolling and and if I wanted to uh, thin this neck up, uh, I could. I would come in here with my pencil and just go zip, 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 zip. I have a bunch of uh, uh, zipper marks on it, and then I would start carving it off. And and you're thinking with a block of wood, and it's like, yep, that's all you want because you should have gotten close to your target in your initial build, so that you're not back here with sandpaper really trying to change the world. Meaning that you knew that you like a 1 or 11 16th inch wide nut or a particular width up here on a particular guitar. Well then, you know, you should have gotten close enough in your rough machine, rough build to do all this uh, uh, refined work uh, later on and after you've played it and maybe you go the route where you leave a little bit fat down here and it's a little bit... Uh, softer up here. In other words, it's a, it's a compound radius uh, a round over. And then if you do that, you're on your own. I don't like doing that just because from a structural standpoint, I like, I like the wood to be, I like the same mass of material here as I have here. And I, I just, I'm very symmetrical in, in that sense. So, okay. Let me check the time. Cause I know that's, that's a lot of, that was a lot of uh, just, uh, words and a lot of energy, but there's an enormous amount of uh, 
uh, knowledge there, and I'm not bragging, but it's just I've built so many guitars that I know the importance of, as I always say, work your way to the finish line very slowly and cautiously, and you won't, won't make a mistake. So let's check the time. 40 minutes. That's not too bad. Uh, it's, a, it's a long video, and uh, prob I probably uh, went off the rails a few times there in the first part of it, but uh, nonetheless, uh, let's talk about... Uh, but as I, as I also say, it's for a worthy cause. All right, let's talk about building a guitar. How do you do it with, with sandpaper in hands, and how do you make that transition? You, since you, this, this was an unbound fretboard, you went ahead and you perfectly machined your fretboard exactly to the finished dimensions, exactly whatever dimension you wanted here, and exactly whatever dimension you wanted there, at a certain distance from the, the beginning of the fretboard or the nut up to a certain, uh, you know, fret location up here. And uh, then once you have that, it's, it's very important that you protect it and don't let it change. And your, if anything, your lower should have been a just ever so slightly bigger so that then you can try, you can actually just visually look at your fretboard your fretboard to the lower uh, glue up. In other words, what you you just pulled it out of all the clamps a day or two later, and you're getting ready to uh, shape the lower to match the fretboard. You know, you don't you're not you're not matching the fretboard to the lower. That's a given. That ought to be perfectly under, understood. But you are going to be making some changes. And like if you make changes here, well then you're going to have to do a little bit more contour work here. Same thing over here. If you had to take some, some serious material off right here, well, you're not just gonna be taking off that location right there. You're gonna to have to be blending it to what your fretboard is telling you because now you're using your fretboard as a visual and a physical guide as to when, you, when you've when you met uh, your tar or when you've crossed that threshold, okay? And all that's just uh, common sense and just basically, uh, working working the job in front of you. So let's say I had uh, a pretty serious amount of wood right here, and uh, and if that be the case, then I hope I have too, too much wood right here. But if you had a low spot or a high spot, if you had some, th this is what you would probably run into. This lower was not perfect, and you never in intended it to be perfect before you glued this down anyway. If anything, you wanted that lower to be ever so slightly bigger uh, at this location, and then it might be um, real close up here, or it might be real close here in the middle. If you glue this up and you realize that, man, it's right at the threshold right here, well, don't panic. There's no no big deal. But it's you, there's you're catching your fingernail right there. Well, then that lets you know that the only material you've got to sand off initially is just, and we're not we're not worrying about doing any round over yet. And I should have clarified that. All I'm doing now is just matching that lower. Uh, trapezoidal path to the trapezoidal path above it. That's all I'm doing. So if I've got overhang here and it's flush right here and it's overhanging here, well then all I'm doing is just taking the material off right here, the material off right here until I start catching everything up. And then once I realize that, that I'm not screwing up and, and do not let that happen, just make certain that you always have this tool cocked just a little bit because eventually that's what you're going to be doing. You're going to be rolling it over and blending it into the fretboard, even if it has binding on it. Okay. You won't be, you won't be working with a flat surface that you're binding. All this is going to round over eventually, but your initial cuts will be just to take off the blonde. And how will you be able to tell when you're there, when you come across here like this flat, And you see, you see the rosewood start to contaminate um, the the blonde. And when you've got that, let me get my dust my dust brush. Okay. And when you've got that, this is so important. Uh, please take heed to this. Um, don't uh, risk uh, using uh, a cloth with lacquer thinner on it and trying to wash this. The dark woods sometimes have a tendency to bleed, 
and you wouldn't want to contaminate your rag and then or your cloth and run the risk of that that dark wood bleeding into this blind when you get ready to wash this i would just uh, wipe it clean with a uh, very clean white cloth and just uh, warm water just wet wet moist not wet but you get you get my point in other words don't use any hot chemicals don't use any acetone or any of that stuff and uh, i haven't even uh wash this yet but I did some of the initial sanding I can't remember how, how it was um, it was really close but I do remember that up here in the middle it was very th th this lower was very close to the finished guitar so I didn't have to do much sanding right there but I did have to do quite a bit of sanding down here and that's where you're having to be really careful about where do you have the sandpaper on your block you know, you don't want a lot of crazy hangover because you do that, you run the risk of this 120 sandpaper coming up here, kissing and, and screwing up those corners. So you want to be very thoughtful of everything you do. I like using a 120 and doing one or two strokes and then, and then get away from it. That, this is what I meant by don't come in here with a worn out 220 and sand and sand and sand and sand and sand because you'll realize that you're rounding something over. Okay. So now I'm not going to spend any more time doing any sanding on camera because uh, when I'm doing this, I need to really be focused in, on what it is that I'm doing and not risk screwing anything up. And uh, this guitar is so close to being finished that if I tried to show some sort of point on camera, I probably would lose it. But right now, I've got a very straight, straight wall, a very flat wall right here all the way down. Obviously, it's very flat right there. 100% flat right there and very flat up there. So the next thing that will happen is I'll make certain that the, the, the trapezoidal path on the lower matches the upper, which it does, the fretboard. Now it'll be time to start coming in here and bl blending. Okay, this is pretty important. This is where you would wanna make certain that you protect your center line and don't let that change, even though you might know that it's too thick. Because we know that we have, we machined this center line as a ref flat and to be used as a reference point so that we can engineer the whole job and, and machine the whole job. So now what you want to do is start working, uh, you know, that center flat over off to the side and start changing your radius. And then as soon as you see your pencil disappear, make sure you get some more pencil back up there so that you don't spend too much time up here sanding and blending and you run the risk of, of losing your flat from your first fret to the 11th it's got to be straight you got to maintain that okay ton of information there i mean probably too much because uh it can be overwhelming but if you just think logically and along that whole pitch roll and y'all axis uh, you can build a guitar or you can fly an airplane so anyway i'm gonna check the time 48 minutes uh probably gonna end the video right there let me check the list um i think we spent plenty of time talking about uh, uh fretboard to lower thickness options but again build your own guitar because if you're building a shredder, your dimensions are going to be completely different. I talked about resist the temptation to uh, clean the rosewood and the limbo with a chemical. Uh, it, it could contaminate it. And the general discussion about neck shaping with blocks and round drums. The only thing I didn't talk about, I'm glad I read that, read that list. We'll spend another minute or two here. Um, just because you may be, uh, may be looking at that going, oh, that's dangerous. That'll get you in trouble. Well, it's it's straight it's straight right here so you'd be surprised sometimes this is far safer to keep a straight line rather than trying to work with this this up here turned on an angle so it'll fit because see you can come in i'll just do it i'll try not to shake the camera but you can go across like this and you know, don't let it turn, stay in line with the neck. And you can go across like that and kind of uh, blend up into here a little bit, get it, get it back on point.
stay very straight and and you never lose that flap so you can use there's nothing wrong with using the round now i wouldn't do that i wouldn't use that let me make sure i don't lose anybody i would not use that to do this part up here i would use this in this fashion right here where i'm blending this flat into that and i'm beginning to turn a little bit okay or either i'm beginning to roll off of that so you could, that should make perfect sense that especially like that right there you'll be able to go across see i'm not letting it twist or, or get off off center with that center line staying very straight but i'm allowing it to kind of roll off the neck and blend in a little bit and then i stop keep an eye on it and stuff like that and then of course you can come in here just come straight across and uh, reshape that heel per your client's request but nonetheless as i said earlier uh, i'm very happy with the heel i've got it's not finished but it's close so i'll end the video with this whole lot of conversation there but not much uh, not much time spent just doing a general flyby so let's do a general flyby to cover the work that that way you can see it in its entirety and as a whole guitar it's beautiful all the lines are very very much identical to what it was I wanted uh, still haven't finished shape that but I'm very close to that and you can see the width of the neck is exactly what we want I wish it would show up it didn't show up in the last video let me slow down but there's just some positively beautiful uh, uh, flame going through the whole body okay and then uh, probably one of the most beautiful images would be that right there as far as seeing the heel join the body and what it looks like as a near finished guitar okay so i'll end the video there i appreciate you guys checking in uh next time you see it uh it'll have frets in it and uh i probably will have already strung it up and played it a little bit just to get a feel for that neck before i do the final shaping myself so be a few days before I get there, but nonetheless, uh, we'll go from there. So I appreciate you guys checking in, and I'll see you in the next video.